This is the roadmap through the Bible. Looking at the book of Exodus. We've made it to Exodus chapter 35. Now what you're going to see in Exodus chapter 35 is the contributions from the people for the tabernacle and the construction of the tabernacle. Exodus 35 and verse 5. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Now, see who's going to give here. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. An offering of the Lord. Gold and silver and brass. So you see that? God can see. The Lord can see if you have a willing heart. First Samuel 16, 7. Remember the great verse. It says, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So, he saw if they were bringing of a willing heart. What was their motive for bringing it? It's not just about bringing something. It's about the heart attitude in doing so. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. It's not just about giving, it's about how you give. What's the motive? The Lord wanted Israel's heart to be into contributing to the tabernacle. You see, today, though, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You know, then there was a physical tabernacle. Back then, there would be a physical temple. But today, your body is the temple. And the church isn't a building. It's every born-again believer. We are the house of the Lord. And we need to contribute to each other. Encouraging, exhorting with our time, whatever we can do to help each other out. And by doing so, we are doing it as unto the Lord. Just like he talks about Matthew 25, you know, they, they said, How saw we thee thirsty and gave thee drink? And he said, As you did it unto, least, unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Or like when uh, Jesus approached Saul on, a, on the road to Damascus, in Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When he was persecuting the church, he was persecuting the Lord. So when you contribute to another believer, you're contributing to the Lord. When you do bad to another believer, you're doing bad unto the Lord. But Exodus 35, 6 through 8, it's telling them to bring the blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shit and wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense. So it's, it's naming this stuff that they could bring to contribute. It says oil for the light. Think about that. Oil for the light. Do what you can to keep the light from going out. What's our light today? It's the word of God. So distribute the word of God. How do you do that? Well, it talks about in Peter, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4.11. Joshua 1.8 talks about, he talks to Joshua, don't let this book of the law depart out of thy mouth. Speak the words. Psalm 68.11 the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Be one of those who publish it. And by doing so, you're giving oil for the light. They could bring uh, oil for the light. They could bring fine linen that's blue, purple, and scarlet. They could bring goat's hair. They could bring ram skins dyed red. There was something that anybody could bring. There's something that you can offer to the Lord for the to contribute today to the to the body of Christ. Exodus thirty five nine and onyx stones and stones that be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. So they could give gold, silver, brass, blue, red, whatever color, onyx stones, stones for the ephod wasn't so much about the color as about the heart attitude 
Why were they bringing it? And if you give the Lord good works, then you're setting up precious stones. You see, they were going to bring onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod. If you're doing good works with the right motive down here, you're setting up precious stones that you'll get back at the judgment seat of Christ. As it talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, gold, silver, precious stones. If you build your building with good works, you build, you build it up with good works, with the right motive, you present that to the Lord, that judgment seat of Christ, those precious stones will make it through the fire and you're going to get that right back. Exodus 35.10 And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. So there are some people out there that God has put wisdom in their heart to do the work of the Lord. You have a work that you can do for the Lord that nobody can do quite like you. See, he had some people out there that was wise-hearted that could come in there and make all that the Lord hath commanded. See, there's some stuff you see people do and you, you think, wow, how can they do that? You think, well, this person so much better, smarter than me. It's not that. God put that in them to be able to do that. And maybe they're using that for him. Maybe they're using it for the devil. But God's also put something in you He's made you wise-hearted about something. And you can either do it for God or you can do it for the devil. You just got to make the right choice. It says in Exodus 35, 11. Exodus 35, 10. Every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. The tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tatches, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets. The ark and the staves thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table, and his staves, and all his vessels, and the shoe bread, the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture, and his lamps, with the oil for the light, and the incense altar, and his staves, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, with his brazen gate, his staves, and all his vessels, the laver and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets, and the hanging of the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle, and the pins of the court and their cords. See all this? He's got somebody that's going to come through, wise-hearted, that can build this tabernacle, and they know how to put this exact furniture in, exactly what needs to be done. They were filling up this tabernacle, putting in the furniture, putting in all the things that God said was necessary. And that is what the Word of God does. That's what the Word of God does when you bring it into your temple, your body, through your eyes and ears. You see, they were going to put furniture all in this tabernacle. Put all the stuff in there that needs to be in there. Just like you, you got saved and now you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And now you are going to put the Word of God in you so that you can be throughly furnished. See, they throughly furnished the tabernacle. Now in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. See, just like they throughly furnished the tabernacle with all that stuff, you need to get throughly furnished with the Word of God, setting up the Word of God in you. How do you do that? You meditate day and night in the Word. You put so much of the Word in you that you're just setting up your temple for the Lord. You know, you want to have it throughly furnished, a place for Him to sit on a throne in there. Exodus 35, 19, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. You see, today we don't have holy garments. Bible believers don't walk in long robes for attention like the Pharisees. As long as you're dressed modestly, you're good. But one day we will have holy garments. See, the priests... It's talking about them having holy garments. They had to wear these holy garments when they would go in to do the service. One day, you're going to burst out of the sky 
and your clothes are going to match your righteousness. Right now, my clothes don't match my righteousness. I wear the same clothes for years and years and years. I've got stuff, I've still got stuff that I wore in high school that I still wear. I still got stuff from years ago that I just still wear. I wear the same thing multiple times a week. My clothes don't match. I've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My clothes don't match my righteousness. My clothes aren't holy. Uh, and, you know, we're not even supposed to take a lot of, like, pride in clothes and act like we got nicer clothes than everybody else. The Bible's against that junk. It doesn't, it talks about the Pharisees. They love walking in long robes and be greeted in the markets and all that stuff and to be seen of men. But one day, you're going to burst out of the sky and your clothes are going to match your righteousness. In Revelation 19, 14, it says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You're going to be clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's going to match your righteousness. When it comes to your righteousness, since you got the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you're as a, you're like a lamb without blemish and without spot. You ain't got no blemish on your soul. You're completely pure and holy on your soul. And that's the way your, your clothes are going to be. Revelation 19.8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So your clothes will even be holy. Right now, your clothes don't mean anything. And James talks against having respect to him that weareth the gay clothing in James 2, 3. All these guys going around harping about what you're supposed to wear all the time, they got their dispensations all mixed up. My clothes don't show my holiness today, but they're going to later on. Aaron had holy garments. He had to wear those holy garments as a priest when he would go in there to do the service of the Lord. One day I'll have holy garments. Right now I'm just wearing this stuff that moth can corrupt. I'm just wearing stuff that a thief could come and break through and steal. Today we don't have a tabernacle like they had it. But we got the temple of our body. And God can use your willing heart, your good works, your talents. And anything he has for given you he can use that for you to contribute to the body of the lord jesus christ so chapter 35 that was about the contributions that the people could give and the building of the tabernacle it was about the construction of it it was about aaron's holy garments the stuff the priests had to wear now in chapter 36 you're going to see where the people's contributions are more than enough Exodus 36, 5 through 7. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they, they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. The people had so, such a willing heart and was so ready to make this tabernacle happen and the stuff therein, they had more than enough, more than they needed. And anything you have to bring to the table is what the Lord gave you. He gives you sufficient supplies to make things happen and then some. And when Jesus Christ himself gave himself for the bride, he gave more than enough. He gives us too much. He's more than enough. More than we deserve. Jesus Christ came and gave the greatest gift. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The greatest gift ever given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave more than enough and too much. He's too much he's too much more than I deserve. I deserve way less. You deserve way less. We deserve to be in hell. 
So God's not asking, was never asking them to do something that he wouldn't do. God's not asking you to do something that you wouldn't do or that he wouldn't do. Now, chapter 37, you got Bezalel makes the ark of Shittim wood and the mercy seat and the table of Shittim wood and the candlestick of gold and the altar of incense. So Exodus 37, 1, and Bezalel made the ark of Shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it and a cubit and a half the breadth of it and a cubit and a half the height of it. So notice how precise Bezalel is with the work that God's given him to do. And I couldn't do all this. Maybe you couldn't do all this. But there's something else you can do. If I had to make this ark, I'd have been in trouble. I, can't, I, don't, I don't know how to do all this stuff. It says, and he made, he made staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with gold. Somebody told me how to do this, or somebody told me how to do this, I'd be lost. And he put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. So he knows how to make these things. He knows how to cover them with gold. And you think about that. When you do the work of God with the right heart, with the right motive, then it's like your work is covered with gold. And you're going to present gold and silver and precious stones to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. All these things that you're doing, anything that you do for the glory of God with the right motive, it's, it's just covered in gold. It may not look like it down here. It may just look like a small, feeble thing that you're doing down here. In God's eyes, it's covered with gold. And you're going to present that to the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And Bezalel has the honor of putting together this Ark of the Covenant. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things that you see in the tabernacle is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Bezalel has the honor of putting together. And it would event, the Ark of the Covenant will contain the tables of testimony where the Ten Commandments is written. That pictures how the law is kept in Christ. It would have the rod of Aaron, the high priest, picturing how Jesus Christ is our high priest. It would have the manna that came down from heaven inside, a piece of manna, picturing how Jesus Christ is where we get the true bread from heaven. And this pictures how you should precisely and thoroughly put together a work for the Lord that will point people to Jesus Christ. Overlay it in pure gold. So they know that you're putting out what you're putting out is worth more than anything this world has to offer. And see, so you want your work to point people to Jesus Christ. He was putting together this ark that would be a picture of Jesus Christ that would show people the Lord. He put something together that for years and years would show Bible believers the Lord. You need to put something together that would point people in that direction as well. Now, chapter 38 you got the making of the altar of burnt offering, the labor of brass, the court and its hangings. And notice that the things in the tabernacle are portable. He makes staves to put in rings. Like there's these rings on the sides of the Ark of the Covenant. There's these rings on the sides of the altar. And you would put these staves, these long sticks through there so that... Some people can pick it up and carry it easy. They'd pick up those, those staves and put it on their shoulders and carry it. He made them portable. Because, see, they was, they're wandering through the wilderness. They're going to have to pick these things up and carry them. Exodus 38, 6 through 7. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar to bear it with all. He made the altar hollow with boards. This reminds me of how the things that we put out for the Lord, you need to make it easy for people to take with them. Make it in such a way that somebody can pick it up and take off with it. Pick it up and run with it. When you put something out for the Lord, Make it easy. You know, imagine if they didn't have those rings on there. Imagine if they didn't have staves in the rings. 
and they just had to pick it up all awkwardly, and it was hard to carry around. You need to make it easier for people to get. Many times people leave God and the Bible in a church building, and they don't think about God or take God with them throughout the week, even though he is with them. The greatest thing a pastor can do is cause you to take it all home with you. And when he makes the word interesting, it's like making the Bible big in your eyes and then putting some rings on the Bible and giving you some staves to put to those rings to carry the Bible around with you. Take it with you all week. Make it portable. Make it make somebody feel like they can they got the Bible with them all week and that they're not just going to church to get their Bible. You know, some people think that they have to be fed on Sunday and Wednesday, and if they're not, then they're just going to starve all week. You can feed yourself, and the, pa the pastor should make you realize you can feed yourself, you can get to God yourself, you can get to the Bible yourself all the way through the week. You don't just have to wait for Sunday and Wednesday. When Sunday and Wednesday comes, his job is to get you interested in the Bible and perfect things that are lacking in your faith. To help you go on into perfection. To help you, to help perfect the body of Christ. Perfect what you had been studying all week. Maybe show you some things that you had m messed up and make it easy for you. Just like when he put together this stuff, he put staves on it. And he put them rings on it and then put staves through it. Made it easy. Made it portable. Made it for where you could carry it around. That's what he, he needs to do when it comes to giving you your Bible. Now Exodus 39, we're back looking at these priestly garments. It's going to talk about making the priestly garments. Exodus 39.1, it says, And of the blue and purple and scarlet, they made cloths of service, to do the service in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord commanded Moses. So of that blue, purple, and scarlet, they made cloths of service. And that's what people had brought. That's what people had contributed. It would have been an honor to know that the cloths you gave was used in the service of the Lord. The Lord wanted the names of the twelve tribes engraved also in part of these holy garments. He wanted it in the stones of the breastplate. It says in Exodus 39, 14, And the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name according to the twelve tribes. So you see how it goes just into detail on the clothes that the high priest wore. Can you imagine the clothes that you're going to wear, those clo when we're clothed in fine linen, white and clean, imagine what those clothes are going to be like. Those are clothes straight from heaven. And like I said, your, your clothes are going to match your righteousness. When you get a new body, you're going to get new clothes. There's no telling what they're going to look like. And if he takes that much detail, and the ones that the high priest wears down here, imagine how much detail is going to be in the ones you, you're going to wear. And see, it talks about in Revelation 1, he's made us to be kings and priests. We're going to have on priestly garments. And he's got those 12 names of the 12 tribes engraved in those stones in Exodus 39 14. Just like the gates of New Jerusalem have the names of the children of Israel. In Revelation 21, 12, it says, And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So he's got the twelve names of the twelve tribes on those stones back in Exodus 39, 14, and on the gates in Revelation 21, 12. And you know if you have read the Bible that there are many, many names written in the Bible. And you know that the Lord's name is above every name. 
yet he cares about the names of man. He's mindful of man. He could say, I don't need to know you. You only need to know me. But he knows you and your name. And he keeps record of people's names. And he, your name is in the book of life if you're saved. If you don't feel like you're something or somebody or special in any way, just remember God knows your name. Your name is written down in the book of life. Your name is in the body of Christ. And if he's going to remember the 12 tribes' name, he's going to remember your name. Now, chapter 40, they set up the tabernacle. Exodus 40 and verse 2, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. So they're going to set up the tabernacle. And verse 12 says, And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. They had to be clean. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So what goes in the tabernacle has to be clean and sanctified. Just like today, like I said, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you don't want anything to go in that can defile it. They didn't want anything to go in that tabernacle that could defile it, that was dirty or not sanctified. Just like in 1 Corinthians 3.17, referring to us today, it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. See that? Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't want to put anything in you and your eyes, your ears, your mouth that can defile it. Exodus 40, verse 30. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and he put water there to wash with all. So they had this laver. It had water in there to wash. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat when they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar they washed as the lord commanded moses you need to make sure your walk is clean and that you have clean hands psalm 24 4 he that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully so you need clean hands a pure heart you need to check out your walk examine your walk it says in Colossians 1.10 that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Second Peter 2 and verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. You see that? There's some people that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. That's not a clean walk. You need to have a clean walk. You need to have clean hands because you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. They had that labor. They need to wash their hands in it, wash their feet in it, examine your life, do a washing of yourself. See, is there anything in you that's unclean? Are you defiling the temple? They had to be sanctified, set apart, washed to go in the tabernacle. Is the stuff you're putting in you, are you making sure it's sanctified, clean before you put it in? But that's the book of Exodus right there. Next, we'll start with Leviticus.